Okay, so um, I think um, we are all good to go. I think we are all good to go. And um, yeah, this is this this is the last class. Um, even though like this class, the, the, the major reason is for is to give a lot of people the background, the, the starting points, what to start with on, on Cairo, right? So, and it's actually been very helpful for a lot of people. I uh, can see like the um the the quality of um, audience we do have is awesome. So today we are going to Darlington is going to put us through on how to build and deploy a con a, a complex smart contracts and then also show us some available tools to use. So um Darlington, uh, you can you can take it off from here. All right, sure, thanks. So I'll just share my screen. I, I, I can't share screen. I can't share my screen. Oh, oh sorry, sorry. Oh. I skipped that. Okay, you can do that now. Yeah, so um, I'm going to build something I've been working on. Well, um, I wasn't able to work on any slides because I, I didn't, didn't really think we'd be using slides a lot to do. And uh, the first is probably let's we'd be learning to try to build like um, um, it's 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 smart contracts right from probably beginning to end, and I'm trying to see if we can focus on building let like, something uh, like um, a pre-sale or an ICO contract so we could touch on a few things we probably did not discuss during the class, stuff like um, how you could interact with other contracts using interfaces and a uh, few other stuff. So what we're going to be mostly, um, hopefully we're going to be writing the codes from scratch. So we're going to make mistakes and try to build and learn together yeah so um probably if you um uh if you know about me stuckness so there was this um little project i worked on that was uh sometime last year i think so uh i've had the cairo the cairo 0.x version right and some few persons found it helpful right the whole idea was to build um a combination of simple protocols, different implementations, right, in Cairo that could enable you uh, probably get your hands dirty and get used to writing Cairo, right? This was the, the Cairo 0.x version. So recently um, um I'm putting I'm putting the contracts to Cairo 1.0 and also adding um some new meaningful contracts, right? Um that's currently on the agent repo, so you could. I'll just share a link to that. I think it's it should be be public. I'll just share the uh, share link to it, and maybe someone could help me confirm in the chat that um, you have access to. Um, you have access to um, the repo. Yeah, can someone please help me check you? Um, the repo is public, like you have access to it. Yeah, um, I can access it. Oh, okay, that's good. So, um, those files, I started putting it last week, and um, those files I've been able to um, put, do if you, um, if you protocols, right, or if you, um, so the first is uh mean ENS. So mean ENS is mean ENS is basically a simple implementation of um a namespace service in Cairo, right? So we know what ENS is, it's a term name service. It's I think it became very popular. I see enabled you um probably have name wallets and the rest. So um we have the simple implementation of um an um a name service basically in Cairo. And the ERC20 is like a, a very simple implementation of the ERC20 token standard, right, on StackNet. So it's basically, um, as we probably know, post the plans, um contracts are not um, completely ready yet. So most of um, the standards will be implemented and we'll be doing that on scratch on like the way we did with the previous um, 
the previous version, right, where we mostly use open zeppelin to help speed up stuff. So I'm going to implement most of this from scratch. Then um, there's the main ICU, which is something I would want us to build today. I would want us to try out it wants that to be tried. So it's a minimal implementation of um, a pre or ICU in Cairo. So basically an ICU is all, what we know as initial coin offering. If you been in this space for much longer, you probably, you probably have heard about the ICU boom in 2017 and all, right? So it's basically the thought process for the application is a um, user can register for an ICU by paying um, a certain amount of edge. And after the ICU duration is over, right, he can now claim his um, claim his share of um, the two points, right? So we're going to be looking at that. We're just going to be we're going to be building the mean ENS and the mean ICU contracts. Basically, the S20 contract is very simple. We're just going to glitch through it, but we're not going to really um because I really want us to touch on this, right? So we're just going to glitch through this, but we're not going to write everything from scratch. So um you could also check out the repo later. There's still um, an EMM implementation, the minimal implementation. Of any, an EMM is an automated market maker. Think of something like Uniswap, um, Sushiswap, Sushiswap and the rest, right? So basically, um, it means for you to um, swap a, an ERS-20 token to another. And then also there's a mean commit review. So it's basically an implementation of the commit review scheme on StackNet by building a blind auction. So um, basically how a blind auction works is the sealed bidding auction in which bidders can um, um, bid for bid to an auctioneer, right? Without exactly having knowledge of what others, other bidders bid, which would sound very paradoxical. Like how do you build something like that one? I mean, a system that is public like the blockchain, but then cryptography comes to the rescue. So basically, when a user submits his bid, he hashes it, and um, there's a step where he has to review the bid. And when he reviews his bid, right, to check that it matches his initial commitment. And after everything, the um, the auctioneer calculates who the highest bidder is, and the highest bidder is debited where every other person can claim their bids. So you could probably check those those out. We definitely don't have time to work on those. All right, so um. Right, so I'm just going to get started. So I'm going to head to my terminal right and I'm going to use SCAP. So SCAP is um SCAP is basically um a package manager for Cairo. Uh so what we're going to be using for development today. And um, what I need to probably use is um, the original Cairo repo, right? So I'm going to use SCAP to make things. It's easier for us. So we're just going to see if scab new we'll call this class five, right? Oh sorry. Um, all right. Yeah, um, um, let's do uh, scab new. So basically, the scab new is um, used for creating um, a new package, new scab directory. So we're going to scab new, and we're going to call this class five. All right. So we're going to move into class five. And I'm just going to open this in my code editor. Okay. Hi, Darlington. Before oh. you continue, I haven't installed SCAB on my computer. I okay. wanted to play along with you. So, um, do you just show me how to go about it? Yeah, sure. Um, so basically, to install SCAB, I thought I was thinking we could keep that still. Like, when we get to the section where we talk about, um, um, tools and resources, right? You could use, but then let's just briefly brush through it. So there's a documentation. Scab has a very good documentation, right? I'm just going to send a link to it. Okay, um, yeah. the chat here. 
Um, meanwhile, so following the class, you could feel free to use whatever you've been using previously. But then let's just brush through how you probably install SCAP. So um, first of all, you could go to the download SCAP session. Um, section and as you can see here, um, there are two different versions there's the stable version and the preview version. So, the preview version is really ahead of the stable version. I think the stable version is still like on uh, 0.1.0, should still be on Cairo 6 Alpha. So, this version you could still you can still deploy this to um, Starknet currently, but um until um version 12 of Starknet is out, you'd definitely not be able to deploy the preview version. And I'm currently on the preview version, so our contract will most likely not be able to deploy it. But so um installing it is not very difficult. So firstly, you look for um, um you go to whichever version you want, the stable version or the preview version, and look for what's compatible with your operating system and your um system architecture right so for example um on um, mac os m1 so i would definitely install the one i use is this right i use this um because my system is a six bit system so six four bit system sorry I, I i install i would install this rather so if you have linux you could decide to go with this and uh, if you're windows you can also decide to go with this so it depends on your Windows OS and um, architecture, right? So once you just, once you download it, you go through the installation instructions because um, installing it, okay? Okay, wow. It's now much, much better. Now we can really install it using the command. I think this is cool. As um, as last two weeks or so when I installed the, um, the recent preview version, right? You had to, probably you had to, download the um you have to download the um the you have to download download it first after downloading it you go to your find the right and um, open your yeah. home yeah you need to open your home and you move it in here I'm going to open it in here and then uh, okay yeah i've managed to install it on mine so okay yeah that's that's cool then yeah, so we'll probably talk about that more so when we um, look into the resource section. Let me try to minimize this. I've been using um desktop in so uh, my um uh, phone as a kidney bit to it. Yeah. So let's just go back to our code editor. Right. So um we're going to create um Let's just create a new folder here. Let's call this. Um, the link on which is the command to create a project using SCAB. Okay, which of the command? Um, SCAB new, SCAB new, yeah, SCAB new, SCAB new. Then the name of the project. So, example, we did SCAB new class five. We do SCAB new the project name. So okay, we're going to create okay, a folder. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We're going to create a folder. Let's call this. Um, let's call this ENS. I just call this ENS, right? And inside the folder, we are going to create a new file. Let's call this ENS.skyru. Um, one thing you need to um, understand is just like um, Rust writes, um, Cairo uses the module um, system. You could probably check the Cairo book. I think that's, it has, the Cairo book has a very detailed um, detailed section on how you can manage Skyro projects in Spreads and Models. So um, you could definitely go through this section later if you are probably confused whatever we um, do in this section. So basically, um, when we do stuff like this, right, we want to build our projects. But Skyro is, um, Sky basically is only able to see the lead.skyro file. This, only in SCAP sees when you call the SCAP build function. So for you to point to the ENS.skyro file, you have to um, specify a module that points to it. We can't directly point to um, the file inside the folder. So what we're going to do is we're going to create, first of all, inside the source directory, we're going to create a new file called ENS.skyro. Um, now, this file should be the same name as our folder. So, as you can see, our demo folder is ENS, and demo folder is ENS.chiron. 
And um, we're going to specify a module. You know, um, the module we're going to specify is mode ENS. ENS is um, the model we're pointing, pointing to the ENS.kyru file. Um, so inside our lead.kyru file, we're going to clear this and we're going to specify a mode ENS. So basically what happens now is um, when um, Scarp wants to build our project, it's going to come into the lead.kyru and see that it's being pointed to an ENS.kyru file. So it looks for um, the ENS.kyru um, file, comes in here and it sees the ENS, um, ENS um, module basically. So it's it goes into the ENS folder and then it can have access to the ENS.kyru file. So if we write anything in here, we can build it and we'll see our, uh, we'll see our build file inside, I think the target slash dev um, folder. So, but let's start with our contract first. So we're going to start with specifying the um, the contract attri attributes, right? It's just like we stated in previous classes, um, when writing um, a career program, we must specify a main entry point, right? You must specify a main function. And when writing a Cairo contract, a statement contract, right? You must always start with the contract attributes. And we're going to specify in mod, right? And in module, we're going to call this ENS. All right. So first thing we're going to do is probably import some certain packages we're going to be using. I do not let I, I definitely know we're going to be using the um we start net uh, get call address. We're going to be using that. So let's just import that for now. We'll import others if we get to need them. So next thing we want to create our um specify our storage variables, right? And just like we talked about in previous classes, specifying the storage variable in Fire 1.0, uh, we must specify the storage structs. So we're going to specify the storage structs. And inside the storage structs, we're going to pass in our storage variables. So I think the um the only storage variable we probably need is um is names right. So just before we do this, let's try to go to our ENS contract and try to basically um explain what the ENS contract is supposed to do. So if you go into the um the main ENS folder, right? So go into ENS.skyro, you can see here that we have um basically we have the storage structs. Now the storage structs stores um, the names variable, which is a mapping of um, a contract address to a field 252. So basically, like I said earlier, um, the ENS or a namespace service rights gives you the ability to name wallet addresses on the blockchain. So each time, um, so to create um, or to tie a name to an address, the user needs to call a store name function. Basically, what the store name function does is it gets the address of the caller and it basically writes to this name, this name storage variable writes, it writes the caller and the name, which this is a mapping of um, a caller, a contract address to um, the name, which is a field 252. So um, after that is done, right, um, the next thing, is to emit an event. So we emit um, the stored name event. And we also have a view function get name right, which can be used to retrieve the name stored in um, a storage visiting. So you could use this get name to query what name is tied to a contract address. So that's what we're going to be looking at building, right? So um, like I said earlier, the name storage variable is going to be um, a mapping of a contract address to um a field 252 because we don't have we don't have strings basically names in name is supposed to be a string right but well, currently in Cairo we don't exactly have strings we have we rather have um short strings which are still field 252 under the and I think are restricted to just this to bit so, but um, we do not have explicit strings. So rather we specify strings in fields. So we are going to create a mapping. To do that, we do that using the legacy map keyword, right? And um, we're going to map a contract address, a contract address to a field 252. Contract address to a field 252. 
Now, um, to use this contract address um, data type, right, we need to import it. So we're going to say use darknet and um, contract address. All right. So next up, we're going to specify our events. So we're going to be emitting an event when um, we're going to be emitting an event when um, a name is stored or a name is tied to an address. So we're going to call this event stored name. Um, it's going to be a function stored name, right? And we're going to emit um, the caller, which is going to be a contract address, and um, the name, which is going to be a field 252. All right. Finally, um, next up, we're going to have uh, our constructor. Basically, this is not exactly important, but the reason it was just really kept there is to show us how to um, create a constructor. So let's assume we want to tie a name to whosoever that deploys. We want to tie a name to whosoever that deploys the um, contract, right? We could just simply take in a name, which is going to be if you're 252 also. And um, we want to get um, the address of um, the deployer, right? The person who would call the deploy function. So we're just going to say, let's call our be called to get call address, All right? And um, we want to store, um, want to tie the caller to the name which is which would get true, which was supplied as an argument to the constructor. And finally, we're going to, because each time a name is um, stored, basically wants to emit an event. So we're just going to emit the stored name event. Um, and, um, we're going to pass in the caller and um, the name. So as you can see, um, emitting an event is basically just like calling a function, just simply specify the event's name and then passing the, um, the uh, argument of that event, the, uh, the parameters it's supposed to accept, or the things that are supposed to be emitted. Also, it's also worthy to point out, right, that um, uh, events should be in Pascal case. So we know that um, the most commonly used convention in Cairo is the snake case, right? But for events, event names should be specified in Pascal case, as you can see here. So for those who don't know, um, when we see Pascal keys, this is Pascal, um, I think something like this. This Pascal keys. This Pascal keys, I think all, it can also be called Camel keys and this snake keys. So basically function names should be snake keys, um, event names should be Pascal keys. So next up, we're going to have um, an external function. So I believe we know what an external function is. Basically, an external function is a function which um, is exposed to the public. So any function marked as external can be called outside the contract address and also, so outside the contract and also from within the contracts. So basically, we have just um, three types of functions on on um, StackNet, we basically have external functions, view functions, that data fo data functions, and then um, internal functions. So any um, any um, and every external function, right, must be specified using the external attributes. View functions must be specified using the view attributes, and internal functions basically do not have any attributes. So if you create a function with no attributes, um, it is going to be an internal function and it's always a proper convention to start at the name of an internal function with an underscore. So internal function. Yeah. All right, let's just continue. So we would be having- oh, are, there, um, are there private functions in Cairo as well? Yeah, internal functions basically are private functions. They can't be assessed outside the contract. But okay, they are not exactly private functions because I think the concept of a private function in um in solidity, in solidity right yeah. is that it can be called by um other functions Another within function. the contracts. Another yeah, function. so we yeah, so we don't have private functions in um StackNet contracts. We just have um external view and internal functions. 
All right. Right. Yeah. So um, the external function we're going to be mm. creating an external okay contract address. Why is this an error? Login the type of found y contract address contract address. Oh. Let's just move on. Either I'll sort that out. All right. So um, the external function we're going to be creating is um, store name. That's going to be the name of the external function. And it's going to take in just similar to what we did with the constructor, right? It's going to take in a field 252 as a name. And um, basically, we want to get the address of the caller who will be calling the function. Yeah. And um, next up, we want to store that in our name storage variable as the mapping the caller to name and finally once we meet an event um with the caller and then um, the caller and the name too all right then i'm just going to just return So I forgot this should always be done. All right. So um basically the stoning does the same thing as the constructor. Uh we get the caller, the address of the caller, the person calling the function. We tie it to the name in a mapping, which is stored in the name story variable. And finally, we have an event called store name. Then we have the view function. So basically the view function is going to be um um get name we're going to call it get name right it should be able to retrieve the name tied to a particular contract address so this is going to be um um we're going to get the address right you are trying to retrieve from four and this is going to be of type contract address and it's going to return a name of type field 252 so we're just going to um with the address of plant right we're just going to inquire from the name storage variable, right? So we're just simply going to read and we're going to pass in the address. The address basically is the key and this is the value. And um, just leaving it right, like this, right? Without adding um, a semicolon at the ending would automatically return whatever is gotten from um, reading this, right? So there are two ways you could actually return stuff in Cairo. Firstly, is using the return keyword implicitly. The other is um, eliminating the semicolon at the ending. So we could also do stuff something like this, right? We could say let name let um name be equal to this, and we'll simply return name. So this works too. Uh, return name so this works too and we can also still do this too just simply do this this works too but um a shorter means to do this right is because you want to always keep your code as simple as possible and just to do this right so this works also and just like that we've completed our ens contract so just to confirm let's just um, try to view this contract and see if we're drawn into any error so we're going to go to into our terminal right I'm going to run this car build command. So to compile or build your contract with scab, we use the scab build command. So there's an error identifier not found. So we're going to go into the stored name here. This is supposed to be underscore name, not name. And um, so this should work now. So we're just going to go back and, um, and run scab build. Yep, so that builds, and like I said earlier, I would not be deploying our contracts for a lot of reasons. First of all, um, I'm currently running on Alpha 7, which is not compatible with um, the current version of StackNet, that's version 0.11. So you probably have to degrade your scab to, um, to Alpha 6, probably is a stable version if you are interested in it um compiling declaring and deploying your smart contracts all right so next up we're going to um let's just skim through the ers 20 contract and try to explain what's going on in there and uh, we are now going to um dive into the icu contract so we're just going to create a new for new folder once again we're just going to call this ers 20 all right and inside this folder 
I'm going to create a new file, erc20.cairo. Yep, and um, as always, like I said earlier, for us to assess um, the contract module within erc20.cairo, we're going to first of all um, come in here and create a new file with sim name as the folder name. But this time around the Cairo file, and in there we're going to specify mode ERC20. And finally, we're going to go into our legal Cairo, which is the file that's tab scenes, and we're going to um, specify mode ERC20, which is the name of our folder. Yep. So, um, we are going to also be having another file here. We're going to be having an IERC20 um, file. So in here, we're going to put in our interface, which we're going to be using to interact with our ERC20 contract. So, but before we look at the interface, let's check out the um, ERC20 contract. Let's exactly, let's see what that does. And mean ERC20, ERC20 So I'm just going to copy this. Green spaces now code and so. so let's go through this um this contract. So um sorry, this is not supposed to be here. This is supposed to be here. Let's close this. Let's close this. Yep, this is here. So um Basically, this is an ERC20 contract. So we we are definitely familiar with what an ERC20 contract is, the ERC20 token standard. If you're not familiar with it, you probably go check out the EIP. But um basically we are trying to build a token that is compatible with the ERC20 token standard. And as always, we start with specifying the um, the contract attributes, which um, explains to the compiler that this should be interpreted as a StackNet contract. Then we specify a module called ERC20 contracts, right? And we import certain libraries. Uh, we are going to certain um, methods from the live um, the call library that we are going to be using. The variable, um, the get call address, the contract address, uh, the contract address variable. The contract address try from tail 252 and um, the into and the trying to trace and the option trades. So well, as we go forward, you're going to see how that was being used. And um, I think I knew that um, getting to understand what these functions within the core library, those can be very confusing and complicated. What I normally do is from time to time, I go through the core library and then um, I skim through the functions, try to understand basically what they are doing. Um, and I am looking forward to probably adding um, a little readme file in the main stacknet um, repo, right? That explains a lot of common methods within the core library and what exactly how they can be used. Okay, my NS contract is unable to compile what could be the issue. Um, all right, type not found, legacy map, uh, contract address identifier not found, names. Um, can I see your full? Would you, would you want to, you know, so Cairo, would you want to share your um, full contract so we can skim through it? All right, just a second. Okay, so firstly, specify the contract attributes, then the module, the get call address, call the contract address. Um, can you remove one of this? I, um, this is not supposed to be double, just start with removing this first. Oh, one okay. of this, yeah. Then yeah. struct storage yes. names, legacy map, contract address, filter, so this is correct. The event function stored name, caller contract address, name field 252. Uh, this is correct. Uh, okay. Try removing that and see if it um, fixes the error because the, the rest of the contract seems 
Correct. Okay, why yeah. using underscore underscore names when you, for example, here, why using underscore names to read this? The storage variable is name is uh, named names without an underscore. So remove this underscore to. Um, the underscore on uh, which function? The view okay. function. That's the get name function. Yeah, there's not supposed to be an underscore there. Yeah. So yeah. let me know if it fixes it. Yeah, it doesn't fix it, but we can just continue. Maybe. Oh, I don't. Know. Um, can I see the new error? Let's try to get that fixed, then we can run from there. Uh, so I've made both changes. I've removed the duplicated line and I've removed the underscored uh, names in the view function. But yeah, it still doesn't compile with the same error actually. So it's a bit weird. Um, um identify not found names. Names. Why is names not found? Was it storage structure storage names legacy map contract address field service. Um, event functions dot name polar contract address name field service function constructor. Well, that's that's weird because your yeah, it looks okay. Uh, <laughs> function looks okay. Probably there's an error somewhere. Okay, probably let's try to fix that after the class because time is going right. six or two. Yeah, let's just let's send me a message on Telegram and let's check that out later. Okay. Yes, yeah, so um, there's 20 contracts basically is, um, what was I saying? So we went through the library inputs. Uh, next up, I said, okay, this is storage variables, right? So certain storage variables, which we're going to be using. So um, you have the name storage variable, which is basically where we are storing our ERS20 um, name, token name, right? We have the symbol, which um, is of type field 252. We are going to store our token symbol. Then we have um, our decimals, number of decimals that our token is meant to have, right? And we're going to store that in a unit eight. Then we have the supply of um, our years 20 token, which is our a type of UA 256, right? Then we have our balances, which basically should map the, which should basically be a map of um, an account, the number of tokens owned by that account. And as you can see here, is the map of um, a contract address right to the number of tokens owned by that contract address. Then we have the allowances function, which is also a map of, um, which is a map of a token to um, a, a 256. So you could create, um, complex more complex mappings um complex than these simple ones here right where you you map tuples to single single values right the primitive types so as you can see here we're creating basically how the allowances work this is supposed to be the owner and the spender and this should be the allowance the allowed allowance given to the spender by the owner so we're going to look at those functions this should be for the approval function all right, then we have certain events emitted. So we have the transfer event, which is emitted on token transfer. So each time a token transfer happens, we want to emit an event. And um, we're emitting the from address, the address it's emitted from. We're going to be emitting the to address. And finally, we are going to be emitting the value. So the from address, the sender, the to address, the recipients, the value, the amounts that have been sent. Then we are going to have, we're also going to have a second function as the approval function. So basically the approval function is the map of, uh, sorry, it's um, fixing the owner and the spender and the value, right? So we, um, we emit the owner. The owner is, um, so if I carrying the approval, the spender is um, who is being approved, right? And the value is the uh, amount being approved. All right, so we're going to have our constructor. So each time a new token is deployed, right? So we want to initialize some um, certain storage variables. So we're going to be initializing. The first thing we're going to be initializing is the name. So we're going to pass in um, our constructor on deployment is going to accept certain arguments. We're going to accept a name, a symbol, the decimals of our token, the initial supply, and the recipe. The person is going to be receiving the initial supply. So basically, we are going to um, be 
writing our name right to the storage, the name storage variable, our symbol to the symbol storage variable, the number of decimals to the decimal storage variable. And over here, we want to check that our recipient who was specified is not a zero address. So we want to confirm that we are not meeting to a zero address, right? It's a real address. And to do that, we use the if non-zero function, which is um which is exposed when we imported, I think, the um contract address variable. So we use the is non and confirm that. So let's just go into the call it. Um call it. Right. And um, we're going to go into find our start it. So contract address, not this. Let's check here. Yeah. So yeah, when we import when you import the um, contract address variable, we get access to the method specified in the implementation, the zero, the is zero, and the is non-zero. Yeah. So um Next up, right after checking that the recipient is not a zero address, we go ahead to write the initial supply as the total supply of the token. So, um, this um token is not a mintable or a vulnerable token, right? So, um, it has a fixed supply. Now, this fixed supply is the initial supply, which is specified by um the deployer. And finally, we're going to write the balance of the recipient. So we're going to specify recipients for so is going to be receiving the token initially, right? So we're going to be um writing recipients to the initial supply. We're going to be writing um we're going to be writing to the balances, right? The recipient and the initial supply. And finally, we're going to emit the transfer. We're going to emit the transfer. Um the transfer event, right? And then um, the from address is going to be a zero address. There's no sender in this case, right? So it's going to be a zero address. We can initialize the zero address by running the contract address variable. And um, our recipient is going to be the recipient. That's the two. Two years going to be the person receiving the token. And the initial supply is going to be the value. So we're going to emit that. Then we have view functions, right? So basically the code is commented. It basically explains a lot of what's going on. So you can just check out the repo later. So the get name function basically returns the token name. So as you can see here, we read the token name when the get name function is called and return it. It's going to be returned as a field to do. And we have the get symbol function, the get symbol view function, right? Which returns the, um, the symbol of the token. We have the get decimal, which returns the decimals of the token, right? We have the get total supply, which returns the total supply of the token. We have the balance of function, which returns the balances of that particular account. Remember, balances is um, a mapping of a key to a value, where the key's account, and the value is um, the amount that, or the balance of that particular account. So basically, as a key, right, it returns the, um, the amount that is being held that by that particular account. Then we have the allowance function. Remember, this was a mapping of a tuple to um in 256, right? So basically, to um get the allowance, we need to pass in our key is the tuple, which is a combination of owner and spender, right? So um basically we're going to pass in that as our as our, as our key. So when you're passing a tuple, you need double bracket. So this bracket, you need brackets wrapped around the owner and the spender, and um that returns the allowance of this particular token. Then we go forward to um to check out the external function. So we just we're done with the view functions. Now, the first external function we can see here is the transfer function. So the transfer function basically is what carries out uh, the transfer of tokens from one account to another. So basically, user calling uh, the transfer function is going to pass in two parameters, two arguments, that's the recipient and the amount. The recipient is the person who wants to send the tokens to the amount is the amount of tokens he's sending. And as you can see here, we can easily get the sender from the get call address. So we'll just call the get call address to get the recipient of the token. And then we pass in the logic. We delegate the logic of this transfer function to an internal function. Internal function we are delegating the logic to is called the transfer is called the transfer helper. 
we go through, okay, let's just go through it now. So basically what this internal function does is, first of all, um, it checks that the sender is not zero. We don't, we do not want the transfer to be from a zero address. That's only permitted on um, deployment that's by the constructor. And the second, we want to check that the recipient, the receiving address is also not zero so that the tokens do not get missing. And finally, we're going to write the balance. So um, a common practice you write is to deduct before adding. So we're going to first make sure that um, we've deducted the, the balance of the sender. So basically, we um, um, remember that the, the balance is um, storage variable is a mapping of a sender to the amount that the sender has. So we're going to pass in the sender, which is the person we are deducting. We want to change his balance, right? And um, his new balance is going to be, we're going to reach his current balance. So this um, this basically reach his current balance. And we're going to deduct the, send, the amount he's sending from that balance. And it's going to be his new balance. Then we're going to do the same thing for um, the recipients, right? So the recipients, um, the recipient's balance, we're going to read it. Then first of all, we're going, then next we're going to add the amount he's sending to the amount we got. That would be his new balance. And finally, we're going to emit the transfer event. We're going to emit the transfer event, passing in the sender, um, the recipient and the amount. So next up we have, um, so like, as you can see here, just like I said earlier, internal functions do not have any, um, any attributes specified. So you can't do something like, um, can't do something like this um, internal, this is not necessary. So just remove any attributes and um, that'll be regarded as an internal function. All right. So next up, we have, after the transfer, we have the transfer from function. So basically the transfer from function um, is very useful for cases like um, when you want to approve the contract address to spend your tokens on your behalf, or if you want to approve another user basically to spend the token on your behalf. First of all, before calling the transfer from function, user needs to, user needs to have an, um, an allowance, right? So as you can see here, the transfer function the transfer from function takes in three arguments, right? It takes in the sender, which is of type contract address, it takes in the recipient, person receiving the token, which is also of type contract address, and finally it takes in the amount, which is of type you win 256. Now we get the caller basically using the get caller address, and then we pass in the spend allowance. We pass in this into the spend allowance internal function. And finally, we carry the transfer from, we can carry the transfer, um, the transfer um, logic right into the transfer helper, which is basically what we looked at. So but let's look at the spend allowance internal function. The spend allowance inter internal function, right? We can see it here, right? It's basically um, implements checks against unlimited allowance. So first of all, we check the current allowance of um, this particular person trying to spend um, from, the caller's wallet. So we read by, um, the, remember that the spend allowance, we passed in, into the spend allowance, we passed in the sender, the caller, and the amount, right? Which in this case is the owner, the spender, and the amount. So first of all, I want to check the current allowance that, that this owner allowed to the spender, right? We do that by reading the allowance storage variable. Then this is just, um, um, a variable that stores the maximum value you you one twenty eight can have, right? They want to check, want to implement check, right? That um the to check that this is not an only is not an unlimited allowance, right? Want to check that the current allowance that's the low value. Remember, it's a two fifty six value, and if you come from the old car, you know you know that two fifty six normally would create that using a structure of um. Um, two units, one twenty-eight, and that's because um, built basically the two two fifty-two bit um, um, a two fifty-two bit value, right? So first of all, we're going to check the current allowance, which we go. So we're going to check the low value. I want to make sure that um, it's equals to one's mask, and then we're going to check the high value also to check that it's equals to one's mark. Now, if this is true, like if um, this 
Remember, I said the ones marked is the highest value the unit, the unit 128 can store, right? If this, the low value is all equal to this and the high value is also equal to this, then that means um, he has probably has unlimited allowance. So we want to implement a check that if only if um, this is not an unlimited allowance, right? Can you now um, consult the approved helper function basically? So only if that's this basically is a negation. Um, the the exclamation mark is a negation. Um, in negation operator, right? So we want to check that only if um this unlimited allowance. Basically, this here now would return using this and operator will either return a true or a false. So if this is unlimited allowance, right? Returns true, right? They want to check. We want to implement check to ensure that only if it is false. That if it is not true, then you can consult the approved helper function. We are we now passing the owner, the spender, and the current allowance. And the allowance right as the current allow current allowance minus um the amount that the user is trying to spend. So basically, the approved helper contains the approval logic. So as you can see here. It um, basically checks first that the spender is not zero. The person trying to spend from the owner is not zero. As you can see, you can't um, approve from the zero address. That's the error being shown. Then next up, we're going to alter the allowance. So we're going to alter the allowance. We're going to pass in, um, altering the allowance, remember it's too bold to an amount. So we're basically passing in the owner and the spender. And finally, we're going to pass in the amount and we're going to emit the approval function. I'm going to emit the approval function. I'm going back to where we started from that transfer from function. So if this, this successfully passes right without reverting, without doing an error, then we now go for that to carry out the transfer using the transfer helper, the logic within the transfer helper function, internal function. Then finally, we have the approved um, function, external um, approved function, right? So basically, this approves the spender to spend from the colors and um, um, the colors balance, right? So first of all, we get the owner by calling the call, checking the caller using the get caller address. And basically we pass that into the approved helper. The approved helper, which we looked at earlier, um, um, carries out the allowance logic, right? As writing the new allowance to the allowances storage variable. So that's just a rundown of what's exactly happening here. I know we're a bit fast because um, this is a seven, so we are really running out of time. So, but you could just check out the repo. Like I said earlier, I tried to um, comment the code to ensure you could, prove you could understand what's going on, but just reading the comments. The next up, we're going to be needing um, an interface, right? So um, basically an interface is how you interact with other smart contracts on a blockchain. So an interface basically ex um, exposes what we call, should I say the function endpoints, right? Certain functions which you can call um, a smart contract. So if you're going to interact with um, a smart contract, right? You are looking to interact with another smart contract, an external smart contract, you definitely, need two things. One, the interface of that smart contract you are trying to interact with. Second thing you're going to be needing is the address of that is the address of um that smart contract. So um I think we have something in the repo. Let's check that out. um South Africa, yeah. So in um, the mini repo we created initially for this bootcamp, right? You could check out um, the, the chapter 14, which talks about calling other contracts. It talks a little bit about interfaces in Taiwan, which we're going to be looking at. So basically um, the essence of um, checking out the ICO contracts is so that we can learn how to interact with other smart contracts, like I said earlier, and um, um, basically doing this requires an interface. So an interface in Kai 1.0 looks like this. This is a basic interface in Kai 1.0. So basically um, um, it's a treat, the treat. I think we looked at, we definitely had considered treats in one of the previous weeks. So interface, it treats, but with um, the ABI attributes attached to it. So when 
um, EBI attributes is attached to a treat, right? Um, the compiler does two certain things for that particular, um, it does two certain things for um, that particular um, interface, right? Exposes two methods which can be imported and used in other functions. The first is um, a contract dispatcher and the second is a library dispatcher. Now the contract dispatcher and the library dispatcher are different ways you could interact with the contract. Basically, if you are interacting with the contract dispatcher, I think um, just, we can't go through all this because of time, but you could check out these and read more um, about what we're talking about in here. So the contract interface dispatcher basically is um, how you can interact with other contracts normally, but you should know that doing this, you um would you have the liability rights to alter the contract storage. That's the contract you're trying to call, right? You can actually alter its storage because um you are calling the contract logic in its context. So um, what we're going to be doing in our ICO contract is we're going to be calling um the ARS20 contract which we assume has been deployed when our case has not been deployed, right? So we're going to be calling it using the contract interface dispatcher. Well, there are also two other means you could actually use the library interface dispatcher and the low level system calls. So this, um, this particular um, mini documentation we wrote earlier does not contain how you could do it using low level system calls, but I wrote about it in the Cairo book also. So, you could also, if you're looking for a more detailed, um, a more detailed um, material on calling um, or interacting with other contracts in Cairo, you could check out the Cairo book, right? Um, chapter 10 points, that should be 10.2. So I wrote, um, I wrote it in, I wrote, I wrote on it in details, right? So you could check out the EBS and interfaces and contract dispatchers, library dispatchers on system calls. Mm -hmm in here so um we're just going to go ahead and let's just copy and paste our interface to save time so let's just go in here um find our ideas 20.0 and we're just going to copy this and paste it yep and let's paste it here all right so as you can see this um exposes all the functions contained in our um Cairo in our ERS20 Cairo contract right which we can call if you as you notice right if, unlike the previous old version of Cairo right where you just needed the function name in this case you must also add the functions um visibility you must specify the functions visibility when for example in this case you try the view visibility for the get name function we specify the external visibility for the transfer function and internal functions are not exact do not exactly need to be included in here as internal functions cannot be assessed by um external smart contracts all right so having created our ies 20.ky let's try um Okay, so we're going to try to um I'm going to try to compile this. Let's be sure we do not run into errors. Let's go in here and then there uh, let's carve you. Right, that works. Um I don't think I included you. Okay, let's go into first let's add this stuff. Okay, let's run scab you once again. Let me try that. Yeah, so there are still no errors. All right, that's fine. Then um we are going to go start up with our ICO contract. All right. So we're going to go into this first for shit. All right, so we're going to go into the source folder, we're going to create a new folder. We're going to call this ICO. Okay. And inside the ICO folder, I'm going to create a new file. I'm going to call it ICO.Cairo. Okay. And um, as always, I was trying to enter call. Okay, as always, we are going to um, create an ICO.Cairo file. It's our source folder. 
and inside we're going to just specify what I see you right and inside we'll do Cairo we're just going to come here and specify mode I see you which is number four folder I'm just simply going to close them um, just close some of these to make things look simpler Let's see. All right, so we're going to go into our ICU.skyro file. Let me close this too. And um, before we move forward, right, let's try to understand what the ICU contract does. So we're going to head into our uh, our repo. That's the ICU contract, mean ICU. And I'm going to check our ICU.skyro. Now, when we first of all start with importing. Um, the interface and as you can see i said when you compile um, an interface right um two other methods are exposed two other modules are exposed first of all we have the dispatcher traits the contract dispatcher traits which we're going to be using and the contract dispatcher right then um next up as you can see we import other stuff like the contract address the guest block timestamp the guest contract address and the rest we are going to specify certain constants. Um, so we're going to specify a registration price, which in this case is 0.0018, it's right? We can see that in our, I'm going to go to our readme to check up that later. And then we're going to have an ICO duration specified, right? And it's our story struct. So we store some certain stuff, the token address, the admin address, the registered address, the claimed address, and the ICO start and end time. And we have the constructor which initializes some of these rights. We initialize the admin address and the token address. Then we go ahead to calculate um, the current and the end time. And basically, we're going to add that to um, the storage variables. And we have the view function, which is is registered, which returns whether an address is registered or not. So normally, what I would normally do to make things easier for a person trying to replicate, right, is create um, an interface of the ICO.skyro file, which you could always reference. But I've not really had time to do that yet. So we are just going to, um, in case we get lost from time to time, we could always make reference to this particular contract. So but because of time, let's just get started. So as always, we get started by um, specifying the contract attributes, then we're going to specify the module, which is ICU. And like I said earlier, um, we're going to just go into our scab.toml file. And this is named class five, right? This is named class five. So we're going to be using that. So I'm just going to move the five, make a class instead to make our imports neater. And we're going to say use class. And in class, we want to use um, ER, okay? In class, we want to use ERC20. And in ERC20, we want to use IERC20. Cool. Then we want to use inside class also ERC20, IERC20. I'm going to make reference to... Um, The dispatcher traits, right? I here's twenty dispatcher. And then we're going to use class here's twenty. I here's twenty. And um the I here's twenty dispatcher traits. Okay. Then we're going to import some certain stuff. Um, for example, we're going to be needing the get call address definitely. But we would likely also be needing the the get contract address. We're going to be need to get the contract address. We're going to also need um the contract address type. Uh, we're going to need to get block timestamp, so let's just add that here. Yeah, timestamp. All right, that's what I can remember for now. Now, to go forward, whatever, what other stuff is needed, we can easily import that. So, we're going to have a struct and um, our story struct, right? 
And we want to have um, what are the things we are going to be needing for our ICO contracts, right? Um, first of all, we want to, I think we would need a register, a token, a token address, admin address, a mapping of the registered address, the claimed address, the ICO start and end time. So we're going to just start with um, a token address. The address of the token we are trying to reference, and this is going to be of type contract address, right? Of the contract address. Next up, we're going to be needing, um, oh, sorry. It's supposed to be comma. And we're going to be needing the admin address. We're going to be the ICO admin. So this is going to be contract address type two. We're going to also need um, um, images, a, a map in to track the number of registered addresses. So this is going to be a legacy map um, of um, contract address. And um, I think to a bool. Then um, we're going to have claimed address to track people who are claiming. And it's going to be a legacy map of um, contract address contract address to um, Ibu also. Sorry. Ibu also, right? Then um, what else are we going to need? We're going to need the ICU start time. We're going to just use the unit 64 for that. So we're going to need an ICU end time. We're going to also need any unit 64 for that. All right. So having done that, right, um, we could decide to emit an event, right? I'm not sure I did this in the initial, in the initial um, source code. So, but we can emit an event for each time a user registers, right? So let's call this registered. And um, we're going to pass in for the registered, we want to just pass in the user who registered. Um, let's see, the user is of type contract address. And I I can't think of any other thing I want to pass in. Nope. Let's just use that. Yeah. So we want to also emit an event each time a user claims a token, right? So let's call this claimed. And we just want to emit the user who claimed it's claimed, right? Yep. Okay. So having done that, we're going to um, work on our constructor. So your constructor should always have the constructor attributes. Right, and um, the constructor basically we're taking parameters and um, we're going to pass in the token address. The token address being the, the token we're going to be calling, right? So that's going to be a type of type contract address. We're going to pass in the admin address. So we're going to be moving at a much more faster lane. So we'll be able to cover some certain things before we are done since this is the last class. But I think the recording will be available. So you could always reference it later. Then um we are going to um yeah I think that's about it. Yep. So we're going to pass in, we're going to write that to the token address. The token address writes. And we're going to write in our token address. Okay. Then we're going to write the admin address to admin address. Next up, we're going to um we're going to want to calculate um the ICU start time and ICU end time. So we're going to let's just see, let's start time, right? Um it should be your six four, let it be equal to get block time stamp. All right. So the get block time stamp basically returns the time stamp. Um the, the particular time is called, then we're going to say let's end time. Right, so um, basically what we missed two things, we're supposed to specify some certain constants. So um, 
domain specify um, a constant called ICU duration. I think that should be in 64. So remember, when you're specifying constants, your constants should always have the type attached. Now, this constant is going to be, I think, um, um, let's 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 make it a D. So I'm just going to go into my calculator. Where's my calculator? Uh, calculator, where are you? Let's just search for calculator. Calculator should be somewhere I'm just not seeing, and this is blocking my sides. This zoom stuff. Okay. Yep. And then um, let's just do. Since we have sixty seconds. In sixty seconds, we have sixty minutes, and we have um. That's this should be one hour, and then we have twenty four hours in a day. So that should be six thousand four hundred seconds in a day. So we're going to use that. So we're going to say um, it's six thousand. At 6,400 seconds for our ICU duration. So, um, this is going to be this. And then we're going to specify, um, we're going to specify, um, our what else do we need to specify, right? Our registration price. Hi, Darlington. Is it okay to specify the type on both the name of the variable and the value that you've passed in, as you've done on line twenty-two? Okay, okay. This basically, um, you could do. I think this should work basically since you already specified this is the UN sixty-four. But this should not show errors to basically because you're just making this um a string literal. But you could do. I think you could whatever way you do it should work. Let me confirm that, right? Oh, I don't think I don't think so because um okay, let's let's just what better way to confirm than to probably okay. compile and see if it shows an error. So let's try that. But I think it might try an error because this is a field you're trying to pass into a UN64. So let's let's look at what happens. So there's still some errors pointing out. So let's let's remove this just just to test our code with our code also. We're just going to come here and um enter on scar build. Okay, that builds. Let me confirm that Nivot Carrier has ICU, right? And ICU has ICU. Okay. Just just to confirm, it's actually pointing to writing, right? Let me just try to make a mistake and see if it shouts. Yeah, it does shout. So I think that's I think you're correct. Any anyway, so why you you already specified um the type, you could actually leave it like this. Yeah, yeah, that works. Oh. Or we're also doing it this way also still doesn't throw any error too. So whatever we but I think this is cleaner. I think this is so we're just going to specify a reg price, restriction price, right? Which is going to be, I think if you're 252. It's going to just basically be um zero point zero zero one eight converted to waves. So I'm just going to copy that because of time. I'm just going to copy from here, and then we're going to right. So having done that, we are going to our end time. Right, our end time is going to basically be um our end time is going to basically be um a summation of the start time. Plus, um, plus the ICU duration. Yeah, that's going to be our end time. And um, I don't. Okay, next up, we need to write this to these storage variables, right? So, just going to say um, ICU start time, and we're going to write the start time. And for the ICU end time, we want to write um, the end time. Yep, then finally we just return. Just return. Yeah, cool. Uh, I think that we are done with our constructor. So the first function we have is the register function, right? Um, we have the register function. So for user wants to register, I don't think there's any parameter you probably need to pass in. 
So um, the register function, basically, what are the things you, do you think we should check? So some of the things that come to mind, right, is we want to check that um, the user is not already previously registered. We don't like user to register twice. Something else you could check, right, is that the user approves um, 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 that the user approves our contract, right, to spend the registration fee from his wallet. And um, let's see if there's any more checks we could we probably need to do for the register function. So we'll check, oh, right, that's true. We have to check that the ICO has not ended. There's no point to registering after the ICO has ended, right? Then um, we want to check that the user is not registered, which is cool. And also we want to check that um, the user basically, um, the user basically has approved the ICO contract tried right, to spend the recession amount and its its balance. All right, so that things will check. And then okay, let's go back. So um let's get the person calling this contract right using the get call address. We're going to be needing that. And then we're going to be needing the the contracts. Let's call this this contract the contract address of our ICO contract. We're going to do get that using the get contract address. Yep. Then um, we want to get some certain things we stored earlier, like um we want to get um the uh okay, let's get the ICU start time. Let's just call the start time. And we can simply just call the ICU start time reach get that and let's just get the end time. And we can simply just call the ICU end time reach. Yep. So having done that, we want to check. Um, let's check that. Um let's also check that the ICU has not ended. Because if the ICU has ended, um has not ended, right? If the ICU has ended, then every other thing becomes useless. The registration function should not be called. So that we use, use the assert keyword. So the assert is similar to the require in solidity, right? So we specify the condition that needs to be specified. Sorry, minutes, I mean. So we want to check that, sorry for that, um, that brief interruption, right? So once you check that the ICU has minded, so we are simply going to um, check that, um, to do that, we need to get the current time. Let's say current time, let current time be 64, be equal to get block timestamp, right? And we want to assert that um, the current time is less than um, the end time. Yep. And if it is less than the end time, and if it's less than the end time, basically we want to throw an error. I see you. Um, I am. Um, I see you has ended. I see you has ended. Yeah, something like that. All right. Then we want to check. We would want to check that the user has not previously registered. Has not previously registered, right? And to do that, to use the assert keyword once again, and we could simply just um, call the registered address read here, right? Um, and we would need to supply the address we are checking. That's the caller. I want to check that this returns um, the false. Else, would say you can't register. Already registered because remember this has to be static to be right. So register already registered. Then finally we want to check that the user approved. Check that the user approved um approved tokens um registration amount approved reg price to be spent. Now to do this to be spent. Yeah, to do this, first of all, we need to get um, um, the each contract address. So 
its contract address. And that is going to be a failed, um, that's going to be like a failed 252, right? We need to convert it from a failed 252 to a contract address. We can do that by the, using the contract address um, try from field 252. So we're going to import that. So I'm going to say use Tacnet. Um, I think it's called is it contract address try from field 252. Yeah, contract address try from field 252. And we're going to come here and um, so in here, we're going to use that contract address try from field 252. And we're going to pass in the eight contract address in field 252, which I think I have some here. Yeah. Yep. Um, so I just, this is supposed to be a contract address. Then having done that, we are going to just unwrap what we get because I think that is going to return an option. So we're going to simply unwrap. Yeah, so um, now this is the first time we'll be using um, an interface, right? In this case, we are trying to interact with the allowance function in the um, yes, in the um, Ethereum. Remember that Ethereum on Starknet is a token, it's not um, it's not an a protocol, a protocol um, form of payments, right? But it's implemented as a token. So we are simply going to um. We are simply going to call, have to make calls to the allowance function of the each token in order to make sure that um, the user has probably allowed sufficient amounts. So we're going to check allowance. And to do that, we are going to call, and we're going to use the IARS20 dispatcher, which we imported, imported earlier. And this, the IARS20 dispatcher accepts, um, it accepts one, one argument, which is the contract address. Uh, the contract address is basically, so one thing we we'll probably need to do because we do not have the token contract address currently is we're going this restart function. We are going to say, um, we'll say is calling this. Okay, no, don't worry, we have the eight contract address. We actually do have that, so yeah. So the contract address in this case is going to be the eight contract address, right? Yeah. And um, in here, we want to call the allowance function. We want to call the allowance function. And what does the allowance function take? It takes in um, a tuple of um, spender and owner, right? So the spender in this case is um, this contract as our spender. And the owner is the caller. Um, I hope we are following. I know I'm a bit faster, but if you get lost in at any point, please just use the chat box so you could just unmute your mic and um, ask questions. So, um, um, so I think that's it, right? We get the allowance passing in this contract and this caller, and that should sorry, and that should return the allowance, the specified allowance. All right. So having done that, next we want to check, right? We want to assert that this allowance is um, greater. We want to assert that this allowance is greater than um, the reg price. But now, um, I think this way things get tricky because our reg price is a field 252, but our allowance will basically return um, to return a unit 256. So we want to convert our reg price to field 252. Well, we can't do it here because um, in constants you can't specify you can't specify um, functions. You must only specify um, constant literals, right? So we are going to Im import um, a function which you can find in each I think it's called U256 from field 252. I think this is what it's called. Let me confirm. So just go into the colleague. And um, that's not the colleague. The colleague, check out um, integer. All right, um, U256. Let's start that. U256, 256. Um, okay, not this. See from, yeah, U256 from field 252. So I'm correct. Yeah, between 256 from field 252. All right, so we're going to use that. That basically helps you convert um, 
PL256. So you in 256, so we're just going to use that from PL252. And um, inside, we are passing in the reg prime, right? So we want to assert that allowance is greater than this. Else, we're going to throw an arrow that says um, ICO insufficient, insufficient allowance. Yep, insufficient allowance. So, um, so, um, insufficient allowance. All right, then, um, yeah, so having checked that, right, this, we now have checked that these are approved reg price to be sent. Next thing we're going to do is basically what the register, the whole um, idea of the contract, the contract is on registration, the user is supposed to send the reg price to transfer the reg price to the contract address and um, then would register the user. So we're going to call once again the ERS20 dispatcher, which we've been using to interact with um, our Ethereum contracts, our um, Ethereum token contracts. So as always, sorry, as always, we're going to pass in um, the contract the contract address, which should be the H contract address, right? And then um, we want to call the transfer from function. So Darlington, before you continue, I have a question. Okay. Uh, what we just did earlier, using the uh, approving the spend expenditure of the Ethereum, does it mean on StackNet Ethereum is considered just like an ERC twenty token? Yeah, exactly. Ethereum is not inbuilt into the protocol. Is it token on StackNet? Okay, because it's on layer two, like because if this yeah, contract exactly. was exactly exactly right. because it's on layer two. Okay. All right. Um so any other questions before we proceed? No, no um question. any other person has a questions? Okay, no other question. Okay, then let's proceed. All right, so um, we're going to call the transfer from function and then um, the transfer from function takes in like the, the spender or the spender basically is um, the owner of the function, right? Let's check out transfer from. Transfer from takes in um, the sender, the recipients and the amounts. So um, the sender in this case is the caller the recipient is this contract and um, amounts with um, the reg price. But this, as always, the reg price in you in 256. So we're going to convert to in 256 first, then the reg price. Yeah. So I think this cuts it. Then last thing, finally, we're just going to register. We're going to register the user. That's not the final thing. We're going to meet our event too. So we're going to register the user. And um, basically, we're going to call the registered address. I'm going to write to the registered address um, storage variable and um, the mapping right of um, contract address to bool. So we're just simply going to say caller. And we're going to say true. Finally, we're going to emit our register event. So we're simply going to say call registered and registered is going to um, pick in caller. Simple. And finally, we return. All right. So that's our register function we just completed. Next up, we're going to move into our claim function. So um, the claim function can be used to claim tokens after registration, right? So I think the claim function accepts two parameters. It accepts one parameter. That's the address that's we want to claim to which is going to be a contract address all right and um before we go forward right we forgot we we're supposed to have one view function which we actually um, and these are supposed to be external functions we also didn't specify the attributes but let's start with specifying the view um, function which we skipped right so this view function is supposed to be called is registered to check if the user is registered or not and it just basically supposed to take it just takes the user's address rights, which is contract address, and um, it returns a bool. 
So inside here, we just simply want to call the registered address, address rights read, and we want to pass in um, the user. So, and return to that user is registered or not. So next up, our register function is supposed to be an, an external function. So we're going to specify external here. All right. Um, then our claim function is also supposed to be an external function. External function. Yep. And um, our claim function, what are the things we probably want to check for our claim function, right? So one of the things I can think of is first I want to check that um, the the ICO is over, right? I want to check the ICO is over. That's the first thing I want to check. Um, another thing I want to check is that the user trying to claim a registered address. I want to check that, and um, I can't think of any other. Thing. Let me confirm if there's any other thing we need to check, right? Um, so we'll check the user is registered, check the ICO has no end date. Yeah, I want to also check that the user has not previously claimed. That's very important. Checking that the user has not previously, we wouldn't want the user to want to claim twice, right? Unless uh, um, that could be a serious security vulnerability that use, um, an attacker could use to drain our contract. So um, let's start with getting the caller, as always. We get call address. All right. Then um, we want to get this contract. I have use for it, so get contract address. All right, then um, we want to get the ICUs in time. Yes, okay, so I want to check that um, um, ICU in time reach, okay? All right, so let's just move forward. So the first check is we want to check that um, ICU is over. Check that ICU, ICU is over because you can't claim once the ICU is over. So basically to do that, we want to assert that um, the current time, let's just get the current time, which should be um, UN64, right? So we want to check that the current time, um, we can get using the get block timestamp. I want to check that the the current time is um, greater. And I want to check that it's greater than the end time. And if it is, if it is not, we want to see ICU has has not ended. Okay. Next up, we would want to check that. Um, the user has registered. User has registered here. Yeah. So do that to simply um, just assert that um, registered address reach of oh, the caller right is equal to true. Equal to true. Else, I see you. User is not registered. User is not registered. Yep. Then we want to check check that um that the user has not claimed previously. Previously, right? All right. So for that, we want to um to do that. We just simply assert. I think there's we have a claimed address in our story driver yeah so once we assess that claimed address read of um of um caller is equal to false else i see you user already claimed yep Having done that, the next thing we just want to do, right? Having confirmed that user um, user meets every single requirement, we we'll simply transfer the the allocated tokens. So I think um, basically the allocated tokens in this case is twenty tokens. Let me confirm. We could use whatever do, but um, the claim amount, yeah, there is a claim amount twenty. 
So, but we could use whatever we want to use, right? So, just come here and um, we're going to say, let's pin the mount right here in 256, be equal to um, in 256. In mean, 256 from field, from um, field 252, and um, we're going to pass in the, um, just pass in, okay, let's see, user can claim 50 tokens, right? Let's just say 50. And finally, we want to use our dispatcher to send those tokens. And we're going to call our contract address. In this case, now, our contract address is going to be the token address. Because we're trying to send his tokens to him, 50, 50 of, um, oh, he has 20 tokens to him. So we're going to get our token address to, so we're going to say let um, token address, right, be equal to um, token address of read. Yep. So token address is this right here, token address read. And when we get that, we just simply pass that as our contract address we're trying to interact with. And as always, we want to call the transfer from function. And then we are trying to, we have an, a contract admin, don't we? Yep, so um, our chance, personally, we are supposed to be transferring on his behalf, which we assume has the the wallet that holds the ICO token, should be the admin address, right? The admin address. So we need to get that. So, so we we'll come here and say, let's admin address be equal to admin, admin address, read. And then um, we want to transfer from the admin address. Our recipient is going to be the user's address and the amount is going to be claim amount. Perfect. So having done that, we are now going to um, store the claimed and, um, we're going to store the um, claimed address, right? The user's address. We're going to rewrite it to true. So we're going to call right, and um, we're going to say caller. Okay. Now this is complicated. We this is not supposed to be one of us. We do not have any need for caller since we've been passing in address. So here we have caller. We're going to simply replace that with address. Okay, address. That's what I'm going to check. So um, in here, we're simply going to also pass the address. Um, okay, claimed address rights. I want to write true. That's claimed already. So you should not claim again. And finally, we want to just emit, emit claimed event. Claimed event. So we'll say claimed, and um, we'll just pass in the address. But Darlington, if we don't get the, if you don't get the 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 main the address of the caller, that means anybody else can just pass in an address and claim tokens. Um. Well. Um. Basically, sorry. Come again. Let me. I don't get a question. Okay. Because initially we got the caller address, like the message yeah. the sender. So yeah. right now, if somebody passes in an address, that means anybody can just pass in an okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. But this... remember, we 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 first of all we 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 check that the user is a registered address, right? So oh, the, okay. the reason why the reason why we do it do do this right is because it's a common practice in um ICUs where um a user probably has multiple wallets and he's probably trying to just use them um, from one wallet trying to claim for his multiple addresses right so you just simply need to pass in the address but we are going to check that that address he passed in right is a registered address not just any address and um so he can claim for okay. the address in as much as the address is a registered address exactly okay so anybody can claim but the tokens will it will still be sent to the address which is registered even if anybody claims yeah yeah exactly it's going to say be sent to the address in as much as it is registered because if it is registered it means that the user the user paid for the ICO it yeah. is registration fee so he's eligible to claim tokens yeah okay yep so i I think that um, ends our ICU contract. Now let's try to see if these um, builds, if there are errors, if there are any, we'll try to sort that out before we move to the next section.
So we have an error here. So unwrap um, is not a method found. The second is a wrong number of arguments. Expected three found two. Oh, right. So let's start with solving that one. That's for transfer from, okay, other ones, right? So other ones expect three arguments. Other ones, let's close this first. Um, uh, okay. Let's check our IERS 20 file. Allow one sticks in what? The owner and the spender. Okay. Okay. All right. I think I found my mistake. So the owner is the caller, right? And the spender is um, this contract. Okay. I think this should work. So we're not supposed to pass in that as it should work. Then um, for the unwrap method not being found, I think we need to implement some certain trades. We need to, um, where's the unwrap? Should be in options. Confirm that. So let's go into the colleague and then um, option. Let's just check option. Option has the unwrap method. Yeah. So we're going to come in here and we're going to use option. Um, option. Option trades. Okay. So let's try building once again. Perfect. So our contract compiles now. So just for your recap, right? Um, I believe we understood everything, but I would have said I just want to do a recap now. I just looked at our time and we have like 15 minutes more to go. So let's just um dive into the available tools. So let me just I although we have the codes available, I will just move this to GitHub and I'll just paste the link here so you could also still assess it in case there's any need to so just let's just move that to GitHub. Uh, Let's call this Darknet Africa. Let's just call this Nairobi Bitcamp. That's five. Yep. You got description. Read me. Just wait here for it. Let me just copy this and Um. So let's um, okay. Let's run a quick other for me. Hold that other engine. Uh, finally, let's push. I mean, a master. Okay. Yes. Using probably master. Let's just try master. Nope. Um, let's try me. I remember what my person like. I think it's me. All right. So, um, I just moved stuff to this repo. So, I could definitely access the contracts in here. Everything here. Let me just drop that in the chat for people who need to check it out later. Right. So, um, because of time, let's just dive through. I would have really wanted to get up to this slide for this slide for this right, but it was it was a bit too weird. Uh, just going to run so. So, um, okay. I think there's the or details on it less with that. Yep. Um, there are basically a lot of tools that are currently supported for um Kai 1.0, which you would find useful. That's not what I'm looking for. These are projects. Um so still, still doesn't have what I'm looking for. You'll die fine. You'll die fine. Okay, but um, basically, Kai 1.0 is still still very new and um, um, 
definitely the stock market ecosystem has amazing builders and a lot of persons are trying to a lot of teams and and um, companies building on stock we are trying to build different tools that can be very useful to developers amongst all of them i'm just going to highlight a few right one of the most important is scab right scab is um scab is from software mansion so software mansion is the the thing that released protostar which is which was also a very popular framework for um the previous Cairo. so um basically the idea is scab is going to act as act as a package manager it's going to act as a package manager for um Cairo and um you could always integrate protostar into scab so currently protostar is um um should I say bits Behind, just uh, let's just check the protostar docs. You could check the uh, just drop links to the docs because we don't have time to go through them individually. But um, Scab is a very good tool you could actually use for um, your um, for writing man um, writing your Cairo contracts, compiling them, managing dependencies, and it has a very beautiful docs you could definitely check out and try. And there's protostar too. There's protostar. Um, let's check the current releases. It's been long since I checked it. So the release version 0.11 recently. Uh, I certainly not in here. Okay. Okay. Um, I've not really checked for the start up in a while. But if you're going to write tests for your smart contracts, right, you definitely need to integrate Protostar into SCAB because Protostar um, is a testing framework. Basically, it works like Foundry, it works similar to Foundry. So you can definitely add a Protostar as a dependency. And use it to run your Cairo tests and all the amazing advantages Protostar comes with. So you could just check the Protostar docs. Let me put that Protostar docs. Protostar docs, Protostar docs, really. Yep. And then um, just check um, Cairo one. And you would see all the tutorials relating to Cairo as regards to Protostar. It's an amazing tool you should definitely check out. Then, of course, the um the Colib, which is um, something you probably need to keep up with if you are trying to keep up with all the recent changes that are integrated into Cairo. You definitely need to check out the Colib and the Cairo Colib. You could actually use it um, um for a lot of things. You could use it for development, for running tests and um, a whole lot of other things. So it's also a good place, a good, it's also a good tool you need to check out. Um, there's also, um, you might forget to, the Cairo Lang framework. The Cairo Lang framework, I think there's something that about that. The Cairo Lang framework, um, start next. Yeah, there's the, this deploy Cairo demo that takes you through the process of how you can deploy your first Cairo One contract, which was created by developer advocates at um, Stackware. So you can do that using the Cairo Lang framework. You can check out more information. I think there's more information on the Stack Network. Yes, the Stack Network. Uh, Stack So um, I just have issues to see what you check out the StackNet book, uh, yeah, book.stackNet.io. You'll see tutorials on how you can set up a development environment and all in the getting started section. I think you'll see, yeah, there should be a tutorial on how you can set up your development environment. So I'm just going to paste them here. And I think that's then for tutorials, so I think there's already a compilation. I'm just going to post this on Telegram, okay? I'm just going to post the um, auditless um, awesome Cairo on Telegram channel, right? This contains most of all these I'm pointing to already. They are contained in here. Then for learning some very amazing stuff, so you need to check out Rare Ripples. First of all, you have the Cairo book, which is which I think is the most superior document documentation currently for learning Cairo. It would really be very helpful created by the community and builders in the community for builders. So um, you should definitely check out the Cairo book. Then there's um the Starknet book also. So 
It's talking about books, talks about smelling touches around, stacking smart contracts, um, running nodes, stacking architecture, account abstraction, stacking and other stuff. The stacking book is also a good stuff to check out. Then there's the official documentation do I have here. Yeah, there's the official documentation we go, which goes in depth into um the basic workings, the more complex workings of Cairo of the new Cairo 1.0 language. You could also check that out too. And I think that's where we'll call it in, we'll drop in. So just have six more minutes to go. So if anyone has any questions, please ask and and would we'll attend to them. So um Vic, do you probably have any questions? Uh well, uh not not exactly um yeah maybe before maybe before the six minutes are over <laughs> i have something i was just closely following and so far um, most of it has been clear to me okay. um what's you paul paul are you there yeah yeah <laughs> um i want to like thank you for putting in a lot of efforts in making this class possible. And also the other developers that took their time to break things down, right? Because most times you get to see this document and all of all, if you don't um, get them, let's say, broken down, or if you don't get them in simpler terms, you might not actually understand them, right? So I really appreciate the work you guys put into this. And um yeah, this um this we have we have come to the end of the Stacknet scenario reboot scam. And I appreciate everyone that has been participating, Vic, um, CC, and every other person that has been participating. And um, just like we said when we started the program that we are going to have a physical meetup. And this is going to happen on Saturday, which is on the 20th, Saturday. And if you want to attend, you just register through the link we posted on Telegram and Twitter, right? And um, yeah, it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. We, we will have um, Louis Gutman at, um, present at the event. And um, yeah, so we'll be looking forward to see everyone there and do have a great night. Yeah. Um. So. Um. Yeah. Oh, Valentin, I think um, this is it. Awesome. Right, we we'll represent enough. all of you who will not be there. <laughs> I didn't get what you said. I'm saying, uh, we will represent all of you who won't be there, but who have been part of the journey. Oh, sorry. I'm still trying to get what you said. Sorry. Can you repeat again? We are going to represent all of you who have been part of the journey, but- Oh, uh, yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. exactly, <laughs> yeah. So um, I'll be looking forward to pictures, videos, and, and oh, I'll try and make sure that we do, just, I will just hope that we get something quite solid. Yeah, 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 I can't wait. I'm looking forward to it and hopefully getting a few merchandise. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Okay, okay. Right now, I actually have quite a good number of registrations for the meetup, which is which is cool. And before Saturday, I think there will be a lot more registrations for it. And yeah, so good night, everyone, and do have a lovely week ahead. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, good night, everyone. Yeah, bye. Good night.